This is section 3.2, measures of spread or dispersion. So essentially we're looking at how spread out our data are. And one of the ways that we can measure the spread of our data is the range. And the range of our data is a value that measures the difference between the greatest and least data value. So one way to do this is to order your data first, especially if you're using Excel, that makes it very easy to do but we want to know what the minimum and maximum values are. So in this case, it's four and 75 because our data is already ordered. Now, the biggest mistake I see students make with range is that students will report the range as four to 75 or from four to 75. And while those are accurate descriptions of the data, that is not the range. The range is an actual value that is found by subtracting the minimum from the maximum. So max minus min is 75 minus four or 71. So the range of our data is 71. Another measure of dispersion is the variance. And the variance is simply a measurement of the spread or the distance between the numbers in a data set. So basically what happens is we measure how far each value of our data set is from the mean and therefore how spread out all of our data is. To calculate the variance, we're going to find the average of the squares of the differences between the individual values and the expected value. So a lot of people stop right here and just stop listening and say, okay, well, that's a lot of math, but don't worry. All this means is we're going to find the mean and mu means mean of the population, or x bar means mean of a sample. So that's why you can see the different um, notation for population and for sample. Sigma squared is going to be the variance of the population, whereas we're just going to use s for, sorry, s squared for the variance of the sample. And when it says XI, that's just indicating each data value. So I promise you, and that's the same for each one. Um, the only other difference here is when we're dealing with the population, we're dealing with capital N. And again, capital N is just the size of the population. Whereas lowercase n is the size of the sample, which basically means they're very complicated looking equations for something that's not super complicated. We are going to do one example by hand, but we're mostly going to let Excel do the work for us because it's just so much easier. So let's take a look at an example. In our example, we have a very small data set, 32564. And we're going to assume that the data represent actual weight changes of every member of a swim club. Now, why is that important? Because it's every member, it tells us it's a population and not a sample. If it said a sample, then of course we would use the N minus one instead. So all I'm going to do is first find the mean, mu. I'm going to find this value. And that's just, as we talked about, the mean. Well, the mean, is add up all of the values and divide by how many values there were. So there's one, two, three, four, five values. So notice that goes here. And also we're going to be using N in our next um, part of our equation as well. So we have mu is four and N is five. Now this part is what takes the most math. So essentially we're saying find the sum of each data value, um, that difference from the mean and square it. So for instance, here was our original data set, three, two, five, six, four. The mean that we just calculated on the last slide was four. So notice what I'm doing here. I'm taking three minus four. I'm taking two minus four, five minus four, six minus four, four minus four. Now in doing that, if I were to add all of those up, notice that my sum is zero 
And that's always going to be true. And that's why we can't just add up all of the deviations. We have to square them. So I'm going to square negative 1 to turn it into positive 1, square negative 2 to turn it into 4, 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, 0 squared is 0. And now when I add them up, I get a sum of 10. And then I take 10 divided by n, and remember n was just the number of values that we had, which was 5, so 10 divided by 5 is 2. Therefore, the variance of this set of data is 2. Now the standard deviation is related to the variance. So the standard deviation measures how much we might expect a typical member of the data set to differ from the mean. So it's a measure of dispersion. We're saying in our data, the mean is right in the middle. How far might we expect a typical member of the data set to be from this value? So how do we determine it? Well, we already know how to find the variance. All we're going to do is take the square root of the variance. So if you'll notice inside of my square root brackets, this is the exact same formula I had for variance for a population or for a sample. And all I am going to do is then take the square root of that value. So for the sake of time and ease, I used the exact same data set. And I said, okay, let's go ahead and find the standard deviation for the first one, let's assume the data represent actual weight changes of every member of a swim club like we did before. So that's going to be the population. And then I said, let's also just for fun, take a look at what happens when it represents the changes in weight of a sample of book club members. And so sample is going to be B. So let's look at A first. Remember, A says find the sum of all of the deviations and square them. And we already found that was 10. And then we're going to divide by n, which is 5 for our population, which gives us 2. And we're just going to take the square root of 2. So we get 1.4142. For B, we're doing the exact same thing. Notice I still have 10. Because it's a sample, it's just lowercase n, which is the same thing. 5 minus 1, so it does change it a little bit. And then I have 10 divided by 4, or 5 halves. If I take the square root of that, I get 1.5811. So the question I get often is, why is there a difference between population and for sample? Well, for sample, remember it's just based on a sample. And therefore, those values are not as precise. And so notice, this gives me a little bit more spread because I'm a little bit less certain about um, how far my data values are. So again, what we've just determined is how far we would expect a typical data value to be. It's sort of our new ruler. We're going to be using the standard deviation throughout the remainder of this course. It's something that's going to keep coming up, and so it's important that we have sort of a good foundation of what it actually means. So the standard deviation just shows the deviation from the mean. It tells us how spread out our data is, which will make a lot more sense when we talk about empirical rule in just a moment. But if we have a standard deviation that is small, then the data is not as spread out. But if the standard deviation is large, the data is more spread out. So question, can standard deviation ever be negative? Well, let's think about how we just calculated the standard deviation. We took the variance and took the square root of that. Well, we know the variance was found by taking a bunch of values and squaring those values and adding them up. Well, we know that when we square a value, it's going to be positive. So I have a positive sum that I'm then dividing by some positive number and then taking the square root of it. So is that ever going to be negative? No. So no way it cannot be negative. Can it ever be zero? This one's a trick question. So yes, it can be zero, but here's how that would work. If, say, I had five values, 
and all of those values were 3. Well, if I took the average of that, I would get 15 divided by 5, which is 3. And if I were finding the difference of each of those from the mean, I would get 0 and 0 and 0 and 0 and 0. I'd add that up to get 0. I would divide 0 by 5, and I would end up with a standard deviation of 0. So yes, it can be 0, but the only way that it can happen is if all of your data is exactly the same. And then again, the smaller the standard deviation, the less spread out the data is from the mean. Now, we were able to find the variance and standard deviation using just our calculators. Instead, let's let Excel be our calculator and do all of the work for us. So to find the variance of a population, so this is our first example where it was every member of the population. I'm going to use equals var for variance, and then I'm going to choose p for population, and then all I have to do is select the numbers. And notice we have the value of 2, which we had found by hand. The variance of the sample, I'm going to do the same thing, but it's var.s instead. Now, to find the standard deviation, I could, of course, say to find the square root of 2.5, 1.581139. But instead, let's let Excel calculate STDEV, and then again for the sample. So that's the standard deviation of the sample and then standard deviation of the population. Now, I can do those summary stats, and we talked about this in our last video. If you go to Data and Data Analysis, if you have the Data Analysis tool, tool Pack enabled. So I'm going to choose the Descriptive Statistics again, and if you'll notice, I'm going to choose the Input Range and the Output Range. I'm going to choose the cell I have highlighted and click Summary Stats and that will find the standard deviation and the variance for me, um, but it will only be for the sample. So the standard deviation 1.581139 and then, oh I thought it found the variance too, oh there it is, sample variance 2.5. So obviously it's not going to do it for the population, it's only going to do that for the sample. Now that we've had a chance to look at variance and standard deviation, I want to take a look at how we might interpret standard deviation. And as you'll find throughout the course, I'm going to be just as interested in you being able to tell me what something means as I am about you being able to actually find a value. So let's talk about standard deviations and what they mean. Marco wants to invest his stimulus check into the stock market. He researched a couple of companies and found two that he likes. And the question is, which one should he go with? Now, if you've ever invested in the stock market, you know, there's no right strategy. There's only a right strategy for you. So I'm not here to tell you what's right or wrong. We're just going to talk about the standard deviation. If you look at pro facto, notice we're not given the price of the stock. We're only given the standard deviation, which for pro facto is a dollar two compared to yards moth, which is 967. So what does this tell me? Well, whatever the price is, is going to be here. Now we've talked a little bit about standard deviations, saying if I go to the right, the standard deviation is one standard deviation, which means if I go one standard de deviation in each direction, then I could subtract a dollar two from whatever the price is and add a dollar two from whatever the price is. And that's one standard deviation. So that's between the two endpoints is just 204. If I do the same thing for yards moth, and again, we don't know the price of the stock, we'll call this X1 and X2, but I do know that the standard deviation is 967, so I'm either going to subtract 967 or add 967 to whatever that price is. That's going to tell me, again, 
the variance or the standard deviation in the stock prices. So I'm saying how much has the stock changed over one year? Now, again, there's no right answer here. If you're risky, notice I could be losing value or I could be gaining value on the stock that I have purchased. So however much you're willing to gain or to lose is up to you. This is a much more stable investment, so you're less likely to lose, but you're also probably not going to earn a lot of money either. Here, I'm more likely to earn a larger amount, but I'm also more likely to lose a larger amount. So that's how we can look at standard deviations. A small standard deviation tells us there's a little bit more stability, whereas a larger standard deviation is a bit riskier, but it could be for the better or for the worse. Coming up next, we're going to continue our study of spread or dispersion by looking at the empirical rule and Chebyshev's theorem.